pals, I'm here today to talk about the eight books I read in the month of October. I've got a bit of a mixed bag in terms of genres and also style ratings. I'm going to start with the two historical fantasy books I read that are part of a series. So these two are both by Juliet Marilla and they're part of the Blackthorn and Grimm trilogy. The first book is called Dreamer's Pool and I think I read that last year. And then the second book is Tower of Thorns. And the third book is Den of Wolves. So the trilogy, all in all, is I guess like a historical fantasy, cozy mystery style. And each of them has an element of romance to the plot. So I read the first one, like I said, last year, maybe the year before. And I gave it three stars. Like I really enjoyed the process of reading it, but I didn't think it was as strong as Juliet Marillia's Seven Water series, which I loved the first two books in like some of my favourite books of all time definitely need to reread them but I knew that Julia Marillia had a new trilogy that has been coming out one in 2019, one in 2020 and one in the past week or two of 2021 and I really wanted to read that series but I knew it had a, a slight link to this trilogy and these characters so I wanted to make sure I finished this series first so I've done that and I very much enjoyed it um, I gave Tara Thorns three stars and Dead of Thorns four stars but even a three star read for these books I really enjoyed the process of reading them super compulsive and easy to read and just really cozy but there's just like a couple of elements that I didn't like love so it just pulled the rating down a bit for me so the sort of overarching premise of this series is that we follow Blackthorn and Grimm both of whom are in their I guess 30s and when the trilogy opens they're in jail in this sort of really horrible jail being treated appallingly bad and one of the fey folk comes to meet blackthorn and says i can get you out of this prison but if i do that you will owe me seven years of your life and because of that you are bound to live in this one location for seven years and never leave that area and also you are bound to help anyone who asks for it Blackthorn agrees in order to escape the prison um, and when she leaves Grimm who is one of the men who is in the prison who was sort of really um, stoic and quiet follows her and they start this sort of life together um, as, as friends as companions who both have um, very traumatic pasts and clearly are both suffering from PTSD and so they go live in this like cozy little um, home like cottage that um, Grimm makes much nicer because Grimm is very skilled in all sorts of like labouring and um, carpentry work and Blackform is a, a healer, a wise woman and so she um, lives in this area and sort of helps with that and each of the books has their own mystery, Blackform and Grimm are sort of pulled into a mystery and asked to solve it and Blackform has to say yes because of her promise to this fey man. So the first book Dreamer's Pool has, has one mystery that is very closely based on a fairy tale, which I won't tell you what it is because it sort of spoils it. So I enjoyed that one, but because I knew the fairy tale, I knew like from the moment the plot was introduced what was going to happen. Whereas Tower of Fawns feels a bit more original, but it feels like it's sort of a blend of a few tales. So in this, a woman who's sort of the queen of her area um, approaches the court where Blackthorn and Grimm are residing and asks if they will send somebody particularly somebody who can use sort of folk magic to try and um, rid her queendom of a creature who lives in a tower um, and all summer from dawn till dusk this creature just screams and people just are finding it horrific to live there, um, crops are dying, um, animals are dying, it's just not a good place to be and so she thinks there's this curse and so Blackthorn and Grimm are pulled into sort of helping her with that and then in Den of Wolves this was like felt entirely original to me because it's based on I think an old English folk tale that I just hadn't heard of um, so there is um, this sort of uh, locale in the woods where this young girl lives and at the start of the book a um, man appears from the woods who looks like he's um, sort of homeless um, and mentally ill and as soon as this man appears her father sends her off um, and he employs Grimm to work alongside this man who's appeared from the woods to build something he calls the Hartwood House which is like super precise and sounds really magical and so 
both Blackthorn and Grimm are like trying to sort of figure out um, the mystery of who this man is, why the daughter has been sent away and all those sorts of things. And then throughout the whole trilogy there's an overarching story about the man who put both Blackthorn and Grimm in prison um, and you get their stories revealed. Um, I and another thing is is that in each of the books there is a third perspective so I think it's all first person perspective you get Blackthorn and Grimm they read really differently the way they, they they're in a monologue so they talk very differently and then you get a third character who's sort of part of the mystery which I really enjoyed so I gave this one three stars as well like I said this one four stars it just felt much more original um, it felt like there was a lot more at stake something that I struggle with with the whole trilogy is that Juliet Marilia doesn't really trust you to sort of understand who the characters are yourself. She's very repetitive. Um, she tells you all of the time that Blackthorn is really prickly um, and rude and um, doesn't like being around people. And then you're always told that Grimm is um, sort of viewed as simple-minded and he's very um, silent and you know people think he's of low intellect when actually he's um, very smart in his own way and um, but you're told those things again and again even when you're in the third book you've clearly you know got this far you know the characters um, and another thing i'll say is the things you're told about blackthorn don't always add up to me um so you know she, she'll act like she's only really doing these things because she has to say yes because of this um agreement she has with this fey man but you can tell she's just a uh, or a decent person and would be saying yes anyway so when it's repeated time and time again that she's really prickly and as a reader you're like is she really though so yeah i i definitely would recommend them i think if you like cozy mystery and you like to give fantasy a go it's a really good um trilogy i will say i don't want to spoil anything the way the book ended in terms of like the overarching storyline i didn't need for that to happen um some people would have been hoping for that i wasn't um it'll probably get like a 50 50 response so yeah there's that. So I'd recommend it. It's not Julia Morelli's best, but it is um, very easy and very cosy to read, which is something I think lots of people are looking for. And then a couple of quicker books to talk about. I reread Nevermore, The Trials of Morrigan Crow with Johnny. We're trying to sort of read middle grade books together. A chapter or two we read aloud to each other each night, although Johnny has been reading all of it aloud because I much prefer his reading voice. And yeah, do you know, I gave this um, five stars when I first read it. And then after sitting with it for a while, I sort of felt like it was a four star. And when I reread, I'm, I'm, maybe it's a three and a half. I don't know if I'm being too harsh. Something I have a really, this is no spoilers, but something I have a really big problem with, with this trilogy, which I think is ironed out a bit in the third book, which I read last year and loved, is that Jupiter, who is the sort of, I guess, like adoptive father figure to Morrigan Crow, who is our protagonist, withholds a lot of information from her. And... It doesn't really make sense like when when she's given the information you think oh, you probably could have told her a little bit more earlier on does she feel a bit more settled it, it almost feels quite cruel like um the way things are withheld from her and the way she constantly feels there's a chance she might not be able to stay in nevermore and um, she might have to go back um to this family who didn't really care for her and i find that a bit difficult um and also when i first read this book i um, like really enjoyed all of the the trials there's three trials but I will say like the the Halloween trial isn't anywhere near as exciting as the others and feels like it's over like pretty quickly on the reread so I feel like that one could have just been a bit stronger but I definitely still think it's a, a good series I just had some issues with Jupiter basically and then a book I was kindly sent for review from um, Pushkin Press. They have an imprint called Vertigo, which is all crime fiction. Um, it's pretty as a picture. So this is a little bit like what the final cover will look like. And this is by um, Elizabeth Little. So basically one day I couldn't decide what I wanted to read. And I went upstairs and sat on my armchair beside my um, to read bookshelf. Um, and was just sort of pulling books from the shelf. I started reading this one. It was really easy. Um, work's been really busy this well, so I've be much more drawn to like easy reading and easy TV, which you'll probably be able to tell from lots of the books I read. Um, I read this in two settings. It is um, just over 300 pages. I gave it two stars. Like I found it um, enjoyable it, to the point where it was like an easy read and I was finding it really easy to turn the pages, but overall it's not like a, um, a super original narrative. So basically we're following a woman who is a film editor and she is asked to work for like a sort of infamously difficult director 
and she has to sign this really sort of weird contract and is taken to this sort of secret island and they're told that they're making a film based on um, the true life murder of a, a young woman from like 15 to 20 years ago I think. Um, as soon as she gets to the island she realises things are weird and she starts to try and piece things together and then like more things start happening on the island. One thing I really liked is that um, the character reads as neurodivergent. I think that was handled well. Um, like I'm not an own voices reviewer, but I think the um, protagonist and her thought process and the way she um, found interacting with people came across really well on the page. Um, and it didn't come across as this sort of like um, manic pixie dream girl thing. Um, she felt like a, a fully fleshed out person. So I liked that aspect at least. But something I found a bit annoying about this book is, as well as this being like, um, you know, sort of like a dive into the film world, there's also two young girls who are um, making a podcast and bits of the podcast are like interspersed in the chapters and they're like from the future, like when, like after all this shit has gone down, um, which I didn't mind. But then I found out the girls were like 12. <laughs> Um, and they read as like 15, 16 year olds and I was just thinking like there's just no way two 12 year olds would like be like if this is a children's book I'll buy it but this is a book for adults so like there's no way two 12 year olds would be getting up to the stuff they were getting up to there's also no, no way like adults would agree to work with 12 year olds on like solving this crime um, so I found that all a little bit silly and, and I also just found the, um, the story arc quite obvious like I sort of figured it out as soon as I got to the island so yeah but it was an enjoyable read nonetheless and I don't sort of regret reading it um, and then I've also read um, Beautiful World Where Are You by Sally Rooney I did a live show on Patreon for this one so I've spoken about this book for like over an hour so um, I don't really want to um, talk much more about it and I also know there's you know an awful lot of opinions out there on this book and um, what I'll say is I read it in two sittings I find Sally Rooney um, compulsively readable I just really enjoy her writing style and this is definitely my least favourite of the three I'm unsure if the emails worked for me um, I find them believable but there were some points I found myself sort of almost not skimming but like being tempted to skim some parts of the emails um, and, and my biggest part of this book that I'm sort of unsure where my star writing sits like I've put it as four stars on Goodreads because of how readable I found it but um I'm just not sure is that I didn't like any of these characters um and I don't know like I was unsure how I was supposed to feel about the characters and the ending and so I feel like I, I'd really like to hear Sally Rooney talk about this book and these characters and like her thoughts on them because I'm not sure if I'm just like such a different person from her that we just entirely disagree like um I find all these characters uh, unlikable um Felix most of all uh, I find it bizarre that we might be expected to hope um that that the relationship between Felix and Alice um works he's awful to her like I don't know I'd hope at this point <laughs> um most readers would read that as like a, a particularly toxic relationship to enter so there's that um, and also one of the characters is a novelist and I just kept thinking like how much of this is um, true to Sally Rooney's feelings and then thinking like that's not my business like I shouldn't be thinking that but it's really hard not to think that when a novelist writes about a novelist who is like around her age has two really successful books and also like the character in this one has a film deal and stuff so it's very close to Sally Rooney's life um, and I just found that pulled me out of the story a lot so just as a choice I'm not sure how much that that worked but um I really enjoyed the process so I definitely um, reread this one but I do prefer her other two novels and I've been really rubbish with audiobooks lately so it actually took me like six weeks maybe more to listen to this one which is shameful and that is um, a satire an autobiography by Asata Shakur. So um, I really enjoyed this one. It's not narrated by the author, and um, I thought the narrator did a really good job. This is effectively the sort of life story of Asata Shakur. The book opens with her um, being arrested, 
um, when she's just in a car driving um, and the police um, shoot one of her friends who she's in the car with um, and, and during that um, one of the police, one or two of the police officers get shot and I think perhaps one of them dies um, and basically she is accused of doing this even though clearly she didn't do it. There's so much physical evidence to, to prove that she didn't do it. Um, and the book then sort of splits and um, one narrative is sort of moving forward from that point so um, I sat her in hospital then her moving through the prison system uh, and the trials and all those sorts of things and then um, we go back in time to her childhood from a very young age um, and see what her life was like um, growing up um, and um, how she you know, got in a position where she was the sort of person uh, the police would target. You know, she was on the FBI's most wanted list. They said she had robbed a bank, um, which she also denied. And yeah, she was um, for a time period linked with the Black Panther Party, but she felt that she didn't like um, some of the way they sort of, um, the actions that they took to, um, you know, get to their, their end point really. So this is a really interesting account. It's, it's pretty harrowing, like the way she's treated in prison is awful. And the fact that some of these conditions ever existed in prisons in a first world country, I mean, in any country, but particularly a first world country is horrific. And you know, you know at the start of the book that she's in prison for two years and then um, she escapes and she's taken to Cuba as a political refugee and she, she's still there now. And so what I found of this book is a sort of a couple of like, and it's hard to say you have like an issue with like a, an autobiography or a memoir, but I think um, quite a few of the reviews I read said this. And I don't think this can be a critique of Asada Shakur at all. Um, and it makes complete sense, but it does make the memoir um, not quite as fulfilling as it could otherwise be for the reader. So what I'm saying is basically, because she doesn't want to reveal a lot about the the activists who's involved in, she doesn't want to reveal anything that could um, put anyone in a tricky spot, like legality-wise. Um, when she starts talking about when she became sort of politically active and politically aware, you can tell she's dancing around saying things. Um, so, so a lot of time is focused on her teenage years, um, in which she was not politically active, um, and it, like admits that she made lots of bad decisions, and you get a really short space of time where she's actually politically active, which I think I went into the book thinking a lot of it would be that. Um, and you get very little detail because she doesn't want to basically get anyone else in trouble. And then you get absolutely zero detail about her escape from prison, which again makes sense because she doesn't want to get anyone in trouble. But you feel like you've gone all this way with her and then there's just sort of like an end point where she's like, hey, I'm in Cuba. <laughs> so yeah, I think the book is much more focused on her child and teen years than it is on on anything else. Um, and one other point I will make about this book is it's very of its time. So um, this was first published in 1987 and at one point um, Asata is on trial um, with another man um, and whilst the trial is going on they're putting a room together um, and they, they begin a relationship and she's worried about having sex with him because she doesn't want to get pregnant in prison and they have this conversation where he says to her if they take even this away from us the, the possibility of a child being born then they've taken everything which I completely understand however I think there wasn't um, the feminist outlook that would today be put on that conversation which was he'll walk away and go to his prison and won't have to deal with um, being pregnant in like one of the worst prisons um, in the US. The medical treatment she gets is absolutely abhorrent. Her child's then taken away from her. Like it's awful. And that wasn't discussed at all. Um, and like just reading it in 2021, I was just thinking, oh, like, you know, um, that was never part of the, of the dialogue. Um, and, I, and I think it would be a bit more now. So that sort of conversation just ages the book a bit. Um, but yeah, I'd still recommend this. It's, it's, very good on audio. And then the penultimate book I'm going to talk about is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. I borrowed this one from the library so I don't have a copy with me but I definitely like to pick up my own copy of this book because I really enjoyed it. Um, I've had so many people talk about this one so I won't um, talk about it too much. Um, I'm sure you've heard of this. We follow three characters. Um, Reese is a trans woman and she was previously in a relationship with 
Amy, who was also a trans woman, um, but then Amy detransitioned and is now known as Ames. Um, Ames has been having a relationship with his boss, um, who is a um, cis woman, and she falls pregnant, and Ames talks to Katrina and Reese about the idea of like co-parenting and raising this child together, and you sort of follow the story from there. One thing I um, really um, enjoyed about this book, and this is something I recognise that I, I really enjoy about books in general, is when a book follows a sort of short period of time, we sort of find out from the point of the pregnancy to like, I think seven or eight weeks after that. But as the book moves along in the weeks following the pregnancy, um, we also start looking back in the past um, and finding out about um, what their life was like when they were Amy and Reese, and yeah, find out both of their histories. And I really enjoy that as a tool in a book. I like when the present moment um, is being followed quite closely, but then when you're looking back at the past and as you find more and more out about the past, that sort of feeds more into who these characters are. So yeah, I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was um, super interesting, super compulsive. Um, one thing I've heard people say, which which I get, and it stops me from like truly like 100% loving this book, um, but only by a smidge, like I still say this is like a four and a half star read for me, is that there are points when it's clear Troy Peters has a point of view. Um, she's in, obviously um, thought about a lot of these discussions a lot, um, it's very intelligent, it's very um, articulate and at some points you're sort of reading this um, either like interior monologue or like delivered um, monologue to the characters and you know it feels a little bit like Tori Peters is like getting her point across through the novel um, which just pull me out every now and again. I still really enjoyed the information I was being given, um, but it just detracted sometimes from the narrative. But I really enjoyed this book. Um, there's like, yeah, nothing I can really criticise, because like I say, even though that was like a small thing, um, I still don't know if I'd remove it, I don't know. So yeah, um, I'll read anything she writes in the future. I thought it was great. And then lastly, this was right at the end of the month. As I said, I've been reading sort of lots of cosier books towards the second half of the month because I was just um, really struggling to um, concentrate on most things. So I decided to pick up The Feast by Margaret Kennedy. This was recently um, republished by Faber and it's very beautiful. And I knew this was sort of like a cosy mystery and it was set during the summer. So I thought I should probably read it before it gets really cold. But I'm very glad I did, I really enjoyed this. So um, this is set in, I think, the 1940s in a small um, Cornish seaside town. At the start of the book, you know that there has been a landslide and that landslide has sort of buried a hotel and seven people have died. And then you go um, back in time to a week before the landslide and you're introduced to all these characters. I think there's around 25 characters who either own this hotel and live there or are guests staying in the hotel. Um, a lot of the people are unlikable, but you start to um, get sections throughout the book from their perspective. Some of these are letters, some are diary entries, um, I think some are first person, some are third, so there's a real mix. And the sort of head um, housemaid in the hotel isn't very likeable, but she's a real gossip. And so you find out lots of secrets about these characters through her sort of um, just being super nosy. And yeah, all these people are sort of interlinked. Um, there's also two sets of children who I thought added just so much um, like comfort and nostalgia to the story. So I thought they were some of the like best characters and um, they desperately want to arrange a feast. And so the, the book sort of building up to this event and as you get further and further through, you start to really wish that some characters live and some don't, which sounds horrible, but um, you'll understand why if you read it. And so, um, yeah, when you get to the end, it's a real sort of build up, but it's it's very slow, okay? Like in, in large part, it's just a commentary on all these characters, lots of commentary um, on class and the distribution of wealth, which I found really interesting. And I would definitely like to read more of Margaret Kennedy. I know she also has a, I think a, a group of 
and like a memoir or a group of letters published which I'd really like to pick up as well so I definitely recommend this it was a joy to read so I think that's everything I read I hope to read lots lots more in the next few months of the year because I have so many books I just want to try and finish before the end of the year so fingers crossed so let me know if you read any of these and you have any thoughts on them and obviously feel free to give recommendations down below thanks for watching bye